I'm Pat Gunn, and this is another philosophy video, this time on the topic of slogans and morals. And I think we're all familiar with the idea of, uh, of morals and stories. Like, there are fairy tales that we've, uh, we had read to us as a child and that we eventually read to ourselves as we learned to read uh, later, uh, later in childhood. And uh, as adults, we frequently tell each other stories and we're looking for a lesson. And this kind of looking for a lesson and looking for a very small lesson from complicated experiences, it's, it's part of intelligence. Like when we hear about Little Red Riding Hood, we might extract a lesson about trust. Uh, we might e extract a lesson about predatory behavior or we might extract a lesson about how um, how bad behavior on the part of the wolf eventually is met with uh, some kind of justice. Or, the, uh, I mean, the lesson there might even be something as complicated as when you damage somebody that's part of a social fabric, other people will eventually come and, uh, and check up on them. And potentially, if, if you hurt people, then there will be consequences from other parts of that social fabric, depending on which version of the Little Red Riding Hood myth that you're looking at. And yeah, as, as I said, it's, it's natural to, to look at really complicated situations and pull something small out, because when we pull something small out, we get a quick and easy guide to modify our, our behavior. And that, that's as intelligent creatures who, uh, who are constantly exposed to a really complicated environment in the real world, those little lessons, they, uh, they allow us a course correction in how we act. And it's, it's part of having a higher level cognition of being reactive to our environment. It, uh, it's very natural to do that. The problem is when we learn the wrong lessons, when we pull the wrong kind of slogan out of a phrase or, or wrong kind of moral, and oftentimes that's, uh, that happens when we're overbroad. Like take the Little Red Riding Hood example. If somebody decided the lesson is don't trust anybody, then that actually would impair their functioning within a social fabric. I'm setting it off against one of the other morals I proposed, the kind of complicated one later. If, if somebody doesn't participate in, in the social fabric, then other people won't be looking out for them in life and they'll face uh, a much rougher time of it. One of the important things about living in a society is, is building those ties of meaning between people and uh, having people around that care about you. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll always think you're right, but your self-interest will be considered by them and how they're, they're acting in society. And they might find opportunities for you. They might uh, defend you if you're being beaten up. They might su uh, suggest that you don't beat somebody else up because you're going to face consequences. This caring for each other can take many forms. They might even decide this would be a neat way for for you to grow as a person. Um, or maybe they'd su suggest that you and they team up to help somebody else or something like that. This is what being part of the society means. It's the mutual caring relationships. And somebody who learns that wrong lesson of don't trust anyone, be wary of everyone because there are wolves out there among us. Uh, it's, it's a harmful lesson for them to learn. But if they are learning to always, uh, to be willing to condemn someone like, like a big bad wolf or so something like that, that, that could be a positive lesson. Uh, but so, so the danger in, uh, is learning the wrong lesson. It's often in learning a too, too simple lesson. And if we do look at these stories, of, of course, if, if we're deciding to learn everything from one story or if we always place the most recent story that we, we've looked at ahead of everything else that we've ever learned in life about the people around us, about society, 
then we're going to be radically inconsistent. Every time we read a story or every time we see a new life experience, we're going to change everything. And that's, that's not desirable. Hopefully it's the tension between all of the stories and all of the life experiences we've seen, uh, either that happened directly to us or we hear from a friend, they're having a really tough time at work because they did something or somebody did something to them. We pull all these things together and ideally they give us a highly nuanced wisdom uh, in the world. Uh, like if this and this and that, then think about this, uh, but still read body language because that's important to understanding people. Or, but don't overread it because some, some people have really weird body language. Uh, and so we hopefully bring a lot of tools to every context uh, that we find ourselves in, um, and and we uh, and, and some of this isn't even a conscious type of, type of tool, but but these ideas they leave their marks on us, and it's it's not just morals as as I mentioned. Uh, slogans are part of this, and slogans uh, oftentimes they happen in the political sense. Like let's take for example American law. Uh, we, we have this idea of treat people as innocent until they're proven guilty. But that's not strictly uh, accurate. If we know somebody is innocent, we're not going to detain them until trial. I mean, if we really know that for certain. So we're not really treating them as innocent nor guilty. We actually have some gradations between. Or we could say that in the American system, we, uh, we hope never to convict people unless there's no reasonable doubt. But if that's true, then we would never want to have a particularly intelligent person on a jury because, uh, because they could never convict. Because in real life, there's always some level of doubt. Life is never certain. Uh, we would never want to bet the... the if, if in our legal system, we decided to have such a fear uh, of, of any doubt that we would uh, that we would conceivably make a bet that if we if we convict someone wrongly, then the whole world would blow up. Oh, we would never even consider wagering that uh, against our legal system. That's not the standard that we're going for. Um, e even the idea of reasonable doubt, we could still imagine situations, conspiracies. Um, uh, or just getting getting something a little bit wrong that would cause us to convict someone guilty. Instead, with both of these cases, we follow a more nuanced view. And it doesn't mean that these slogans are completely meaningless. Instead, it means that they're signs, signifiers of certain value commitments. Uh, they're like in, in the first one, treat people as innocent until proven guilty. What it really means is we don't assume guilt after an accusation. It doesn't, innocent is the wrong word, but if, if after, the, after the trial somebody is not convicted, then hopefully society will generally treat them as probably being innocent. And while they're in the custody of law enforcement, we don't want them uh, treated as somebody which, as far as we can tell, uh, is a criminal. So it, it means that there's a difference, but it doesn't mean that there's really only two, two poles on the matter. There might be several different statuses for how guilty some, somebody probably is. Um, and, or not how guilty, but how likely we think it is that they're guilty. And when it comes to convicting uh, only when there's a reasonable doubt, what this really means is that we want the bar set pretty high for how certain we are that somebody is guilty before we convict them. And that, that's a noble aspiration. That's, that's a good metric to hold. It's not the absolutist metric that you might get from paying attention to the slogan a little bit too much. But the slogan is, is more or less nudging us in this direction. And the, the slogan is, uh, is old enough that it was meant as a contrast to how 
the people that were setting up our legal system were worried that um, that other systems were working like in practice. So slogans, they, they have a certain usefulness as signifiers, as meanings of value, but they are almost always oversimplifying and we should be willing to dissect them. Chances are if you go to a march, people will be shouting things that don't really make sense if you take them completely serious, uh, seriously. They're going to fail to cover nuances. Um, like if you go to a, a pro-choice march uh, and they're protesting against uh, regulations on abortion, uh, I've gone to those marches because I personally believe that um, at least up until there's very significant brain development, uh, abortion is not a morally significant act. Uh, and most, the vast majority of all abortions in the United States happen before there's significant brain development. And even, uh, even later on after there's significant brain development, uh, I think that the significance is not something that's suddenly attained, but rather it's something that slowly grows. So even by the time of birth, it's not the equivalent of killing a, a an adult or or a toddler or uh, anything anything like that. It's uh, it's a lesser problem, uh, and it's not really that important. Uh, this distinction for the purposes of people who, who believe that abortion should be permitted uh, or shouldn't be considered pro uh, problematic right up until uh, birth itself because very few abortions happen uh, late in, uh, in pregnancy. Uh, the vast majority of them happen uh, much earlier. And so, uh, uh, so uh, but you often, you might hear a, a slogan there that regulations on abortion amount to somebody being anti-woman. And that's not actu uh, actually an accurate slogan. Uh, I mean, for one thing, you, you find plenty of, uh, of women who, for various reasons, also are against uh, abortion. And it feels, it's at least a hint that the slogan is problematic when you find the claim that women are being anti-woman or uh, or, or things of that sort. Now you still might imagine it. Uh, you still might want to press on onwards with defending that slogan. But when you dissect it, it it falls apart, or at least I, I claim it falls apart because um, the idea that that uh, that the idea of being uh, comfortable with, with abortion is a matter of maximal liberty for women is not consistent with a general view of being comfortable with laws. Like, one could imagine that uh, any support for rule of law, any support for laws at all is anti-human because laws restrict people's behavior. Well, of course they do. That's, that's their purpose. And it's generally society's debate as to whether those restrictions are sensible or not. But the fact that um, a law does restrict somebody's behavior doesn't make it anti-human per se. One would need to build a different kind of argument uh, or a different style of inquiry to actually examine whether it's, um, whether it's anti-human or anti-woman or anything of that sort, which isn't to say that such marches are pointless. It just means that that slogan is kind of problematic. But when people go to a slogan, you don't often hear, you don't often see people opting out. Uh, you don't often hear them say, uh, think, well, that's, that slogan is not, doesn't really make sense when you think about it enough. Generally people, when they go to a, uh, to a march, they'll participate in all of the slogans, all of the chants uh, that come along with them. And, uh, for, uh, so sometimes, I, I mean, uh, so 
I claim that this is sloppy and that it's problematic. And sometimes these marches happen because some organizations' marches are really are full of people with bad ideas. Uh, some anarcho-socialists have this slogan of nobody talks, everybody walks when it comes to dealing with police. And they'll take this right up to the point of testifying in court if somebody sees somebody else do something illegal. And I think that that slogan is really pretty problematic, but it, uh, it's, it's a terrible idea. But if you actually talk with them, they believe it, it's part of their political philosophy, uh, and it, it fits into the, the rest of their beliefs. So they're actually not saying something that they don't believe. They actually believe that. And so that's not actually what I'm criticizing here. Um, we could investigate that slogan at some other time. If, if I do a video on rule of law or on activism or, or on anarcho-socialism in the broader sense. But uh, at, at, at other times, people might not even believe fairly neutral things that they parade around. Like if, if you go to a Tea Party rally, you often hear people say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag and to my republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all, or something like that. At least that's how it was originally written in 1892 by the Christian socialist and Baptist minister Francis uh, Bellamy. But you often hear this pledge, or in its more modern and kind of twisted form, at Tea Party marches by people who are also gathering peti uh, petitions for their state to withdraw uh, from the United States. And if you if you looked at the WhiteHouse.gov's um, petition site, you'd see them presenting these petitions. Mr. President, please allow my state to um, voluntarily remove itself from the United States. And there's an inconsistency there with, uh, with the notion of indivisibility that's mentioned in the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, but they're not necessarily thinking about it in a consistent way, even if they, they love parading it around. Now, not every individual is going to vote, uh, or is going to be an advocate of both, even within the Tea Party. And that's fine, but a lot of people, they don't treat the slogans very seriously. They don't think about how well they fit into their broader philosophy. And I think that that's, that's a problem. You'll hear all kinds of slogans in life. If you're doing activism, or if you're just, if you like arguing on the internet, or if you like thinking about this kind of stuff, you'll hear all kinds of slogans that are for your side, or against it, or for some third side, or maybe you don't even have a side, or you're always choosing the lesser harm by your values, like I am, because I'm not a Democrat, um, but I usually vote Democrat, and I'm not actually a centrist either. Uh, I, I would describe myself as being to the left of Democrats, but I usually vote Democrat because I see that as being the most strategically useful vote for my values. And I, I generally advocate that most people do this. Like if you had 10 people on the ballot, but only two people had a reasonable shot at winning, you could either actually vote for the person who's most like your values, but a lot of the time you would end up throwing your vote away because of how our voting system works in the United States. So strate strategically thinking, if you think that there's enough of a difference between the parties, and I do, then you're going to vote for among the parties that have a decent shot at winning. You'll then vote for the one that's the most likely to, or, or that uh, you'll vote for the one that's most like you among those likely to win. And because of the way our electoral system works, it's a, essentially a two-party system. So that means most likely you're voting Democrat or Republican, uh, at least on the national scale. And so that's what I do. I would prefer someone much, much more liberal. I would, uh, and liberal it is itself a kind of vague term. There are lots of different kinds of liberals, just like there are lots of different kinds of Republicans, uh, uh, liberals and uh, conservatives, or Republicans and Democrats. 
I'm a very particular kind of liberal uh, that uh, naturally, if it were only other liberals out there, then I would be hoping for my kind of liberal to win. Uh, but given that my kind of liberal uh, also is in contest with all kinds of conservatives, um, strategically I'm willing to vote for what amounts to the mainstream party that is liberal in the United States, which is uh, the Democrats. But if there were a credible socialist party that actually had a shot at winning, uh, I would be voting for it. Um, so you'll, you'll hear all these slogans come election season. And what uh, my advice is to develop a habit, even for the, the slogans that are most flattering for you, that paint you as a hero or paint your opponents as fascists or slavers or thieves or whatever, pull that slogan apart. Uh, dissect it and figure out how accurate it is, how fair it is, because it's probably not. It's probably not fair. It's probably not careful. Um, maybe you'll chant it anyhow because the cause is just that important and solidarity with your group is that important. But I hope sometime you'll have a choice between slogans and you will uh, you might be able to find one that's uh, uh, that's careful and accurate and still has the zing that, that you're looking for. The same thing goes for arguments. You'll probably occasionally hear really bad arguments for causes that you think are really good. Um, or you'll hear people having bad ideas on how to solve a real problem. And I'm hoping that you're willing to criticize those bad arguments or problematic perspectives, even if they're on your side. Maybe you'll, you'll just rein them in. This won't always work though, and sometimes you'll need to work with people uh, with whom you only agree 70% or 40% on a few causes, particularly when there are only two sides. But I would suggest being careful with your allegiances, really spelling out what you think, and try not to lose yourself in slogans or arguments, or with the, str with the strange bedfellows that politics sometimes uh, tempts us with. And the same, same thing goes with, uh, for firebrands. Um, uh, th there is this problem of catharsis uh, that I mentioned in, a, uh, in an earlier, uh, earlier video. And be careful of that catharsis, particularly in public discourse within a movement. Because fairly often, people will flock to people who, uh, to those few leaders who say the really fun things the most cathartic things, the things that really paint your opponents as monsters and you as being the people who are in the right, maybe the shining paladins coming in to save people from the horrible uh, Democrats or Republicans or pro or anti-abortionists or whatever. And those people are uh, the people who are saying the least responsible things. Uh, if you're a secular person like me, there are certain uh, there are uh, there's a certain group of people who will paint religious people in the worst imaginable light and say the most ridiculous things about them, and that's just as problematic as the religious uh, as the as the preachers who say the most ridiculous things about non-religious people or people of a different religion. Those people. The, the people who say such irresponsible things, they're very dangerous. And ideally, you should be trying to figure out how to pull their crowd away from them, uh, how to break group thought that's unhealthy. Be, uh, and so you, you'll feel a real tension at various points in your life between use of, of slogans and between criticizing people who are saying the irresponsible thing, but who are still managing to draw a crowd, particularly when you know that that crowd, either in the mood that they're in right now or in the more general sense, are not uh, are not ready to carefully engage with issues and recognize the humanity of their uh, of people who disagree with them. Uh, and the power of slogans is great, but it's a very very dangerous power. 
and the the power of pulling small lessons out of big complicated events it's great and it's part of how we all think but it's also similarly dangerous uh, so I, I hope that people are careful with that I hope they see the danger and I hope that they develop this habit of dissecting slogans and maybe even having a willingness to stop people on their own side or to stop a chant or to stop uh, particularly when chants go further into actions that are problematic, to be willing to, to break apart group thought, um, even friendly group thought, to, pre uh, to prevent a movement from going too far or to prevent a movement from going into theoretical ground that it shouldn't, to prevent, uh, to prevent things that make discourse uh, among a diverse set of people impossible. I hope that we're responsible enough to do that, uh, and that we're and that we keep this certain wariness uh, when we're performing activism. And I hope that it doesn't stop us from still doing activism, because it's not good enough in activism to say that that there's a flaw in something. Many worthwhile things that we do have flaws. We need the ability to participate in things that are flawed. We need the ability to support things that are flawed while always trying to think about how we could do better. But we should also be willing to step away when those flaws become so dangerous that they derail the goodness, whatever notion of goodness we're pursuing to begin with. So I hope this has been an interesting discussion. I would be happy to continue it in the comments section. Uh, again, I hope that we're uh, we're going to have reasonable discourse there if we're going to have discourse. Uh, and I'll see you there.